It became known as Black September, the month of the lives of hundreds of airplane passengers lay in the balance. More than 300 people were taken hostage when Palestinian extremists hijacked four airliners between September the 6th and September the 9th, 1970. Three of the flights landed at Dawson's Field, a desert airstrip the militants renamed Revolution Airport. On September the 12th, they blew up the three aircraft to demonstrate their resolution, moments after the last 40 passengers left the aircraft. The dramatic footage of massive jet fuel explosions and billowing smoke mesmerized the world television audience and put greater pressure on the affected governments. The People's Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a segment of the Palestine Liberation Organization, said it had taken the drastic step because it believed military action was about to be launched to retake the planes. The guerrillas were constantly battling Jordanian forces in the streets of Amman with the hotel housing most of the hostages taking heavy fire. Although the terrorists had successfully captured two flights, with the third brought in later by an unaffiliated sympathizer, two hijackings did not go as planned. The taking of LL Flight 219 was foiled when pilot Uri Bar Lev put the Boeing 707 into steep nosedive and threw the two terrorists off balance. The flight landed safely at Heathrow where Leila Khaled was taken into custody. The other would-be hijacker, Patrick Arguello, died from injuries received during the struggle. A fourth flight refueled in Beirut, where another nine militants boarded the plane and diverted to Cairo after its pilots successfully convinced the hijackers that the 747 was too big to land in the desert. It was wired with explosives and blown up a few moments after the passengers disembarked. The PFLP's demands included the release of Leila Khaled and Palestinian prisoners in Germany, Switzerland and Israel within 72 hours. At a press conference in Amman, the Marxist-Leninist group transfixed the world as it outlined its manifesto. To make it clear to the whole world that PFLP is not a bloodthirsty organization we have released all women and children and sick gradually since the first day. PFLP had also transferred the rest, that is the 40 passengers, who are classified as suspects under interrogation or hostages by the revolution, have transferred them <coughs> into a more cozy place. Nevertheless, these people are now living in much better conditions than that on the airfield or in our refugee camps. And they will be kept there until our prisoners are released. PFLP had destroyed completely today the three planes, practicing one of its strategical lines to hit the imperialist and Zionist interests all over the world, and in reaction, to the stand of the imperialist and Zionist powers. Behind the scenes, there was tension between allies Britain and the United States after British Prime Minister Edward Heath decided to secretly negotiate with the terrorists. US President Richard Nixon, on the other hand, favored direct military action. He instructed his Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, to arrange for PFLP positions to be bombed in retaliation for the hijackings. However, Laird told his president inclement weather made this impossible. He later admitted that this was an excuse to avoid carrying out the order, as he thought it would damage American interests given the country was already fighting a debilitating war in Vietnam. Nixon also announced that armed air marshals would travel on U.S. commercial flights and that security would be stepped up at U.S. airports. Calling hijacking piracy of the skies, he called on the international community to suspend airline services with countries that refuse to punish or extradite hijackers. The British government quickly assessed that a military solution was impractical and concentrated on resolving the standoff through diplomacy. It successfully negotiated an extension of the 72-hour deadline, and six days later, after an assurance that Khaled would be freed, most of the women and children were released. Jordan's leader, King Hussein, ended his policy of tolerating Palestinian militant activities in his country and launched an all-out war on the Palestinian Liberation Organization. 
the situation reached crisis point when Syrian tanks crossed the border. Hussein took the unprecedented step of secretly requesting that Israel launch a counterstrike, an appeal it denied. Within a year, the PLO had been driven from Jordan and set up headquarters in Lebanon, an act that was to have bloody consequences for that country. But the PFLP judged the hijackings a success. Spokesman Bassam Abu Sharif recalled the confusion among some of the American passengers who had no sense of the geography or history of the Middle East. One man thought they'd landed in Africa. No, Abu Sharif told him, you are in Jordan and we are Palestinian guerrillas. The man had never heard of Palestine. By the time the situation was resolved, many more Americans knew about the Palestinians' grievances. The events of Black September were the prelude to a more violent chapter in the struggle for the Palestinian cause. The 1970s saw several more hijacks and some deadly actions, including the massacre of Israeli athletes at the 1972 Munich Olympics and the murder of 27 people in the lobby of Israel's Lod Airport. Leila Khaled now lives in Jordan with her husband and sons and has renounced her support of hijacking as a valid means of protest. However, she says she stands by her actions in 1970 and believes the hijackings brought the Palestinian cause to world attention and demonstrated that governments could be held to ransom when the lives of their citizens were under threat. After the Dawson's Field hijackings, air travel was never the same again.